Hello, my name is David Adess. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry podcast reading series called Poets Corner in association with West Words in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. As most of you would know, because you've seen it before, of course, uh, each month I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them around a theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today is Adam Aitken, who will be reading poems and talking with me on the theme of dealing with fathers in poetry. But first, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Adam is recording from Balmain also in Sydney. I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the Wellameda people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft and of the Gadigal clan of the Eora nation, the traditional custodians of the land in Balmain and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land which has never been ceded or given up. Adam Aiken has a very, very short CV. Uh, there is a much longer one, I'm sure, but this is this is the one I've got. Adam Aiken has published eight books and won the Patrick White Award in 2021. He co-edited the anthology Asian Australian Poets. He taught at the University of Technology for many years. He now divides his time between France, Thailand and Sydney. He'll be reading today from his latest book, Revenants which was shortlisted for the 2023 Kenneth Slesser Prize for Poetry. Hello, Adam, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hi, David. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah it's taken us a while to get this happening, hasn't it? Uh, we've been it has, yeah. For a couple of years, but here we are. Yeah. Now, you're going to be reading um, poems today on the theme of dealing with fathers in poetry from uh, your latest book, Revenants. That's um, right. It is by... By no means the only theme running through your poetry or, or even this book. Um, why mm. did you choose that as your theme when you could have chosen so many others? Uh, well, I think it's because my uh, the subject of, of my father ties together um, a lot of the, the ideas in the book and uh, ties together some of the geographies of the book uh, because he, in a sense... I've been a traveller and uh, written about diff quite a lot of different places in my life. And, and my father was also a traveller and also lived in, in three or four different countries at various times. Um, so that's part of it. But also that my father died in 2017 uh, on Armistice Day, actually. And uh, it this book sort of obviously is a is a response to to uh pe parents passing away um and uh also a response to the sort of writing I I had been doing about my father uh in the last few years yeah. mm. I was I was uh interested in uh, the poetry sort of says certain things but but I don't glean a lot about the man um uh just yes. glimpses, just glimpses really um i was i was wondering whether your father was a raconteur whether he was expansive with stories about his life or or whether he was not very forthcoming and you had to sort of dig around for it uh it's it's a par he he was a bit uh uh paradoxical in many ways he he, he was he was a very public man uh he was an advertising executive and then he became a landscape gardener. Um, he had a very kind of public persona, a very outgoing, he loved to have fun. Yes, he did. He wasn't really a raconteur as such, but he did, he was, he enjoyed a uh, social, social life. He enjoyed company of lots of people, but deep down he was quite a, uh, a private person as well. And, uh, not somebody who wanted to talk too much about his own life, uh, his own past at all. Um, and 
part of the this book and the the memoir I wrote uh, 100 letters home is really about about his uh past or the the life his his parentage as well his family my ancestry mm -hmm. uh but this po this poetry book is not really a biography of my father we just chose that topic to start things off with. i mean i don't want to dig around into too much personal stuff but you know it is a subject um can you say something about your relationship to your father and 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 um why it is important to, to you to explore that in in your poetry uh well my own relationship with my father was very complex and sometimes very very difficult uh for various <clears throat> pardon me <clears throat> for various reasons um partly because of our personalities and partly because of our, our circumstances Tra when I was young, travelling around from places like Malaysia. I was born in the UK, but uh, my father and my mother took, migrated to, to Malaysia for a couple of years where he worked as an advertising executive. Uh, then uh, when I was about eight, we all came back to Australia via Perth um and that was just moving countries moving houses moving homes has impacted my life uh, a great deal my own personality my own sense of who i am where i belong uh but also his own his own sense of where, who he was and where he belonged was very complex because of partly uh this 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 strange travel and migration and and uh professional uh, peripatetic life, move, a life of moving countries. Yeah. Um, but but deep down, he also didn't want me to uh, to write too much about him. But I think most most parents are very ambivalent about their children writing about them because they want to they want to edit the edit the story. Of course, it's a natural thing. Uh, so part of our difficulty and tension. Uh, was, you know, this negotiation or what John Kinsella calls a diplomacy between the writer and the subject, you know, the son being the writer and, and, and the parent being the subject, you know. Uh, and, of course, sons and fathers, generally, it's a very powerful um, and fraught sort of relationship. Uh, it could be very, very good. Uh, it's it's sort of at the center of our patriarchal culture, basically as well. That the son, the father, is the is the the, the powerful one. You know, Freud talks about Oedipus and the Oedipus complex, whatever you think of that. Um, and of course, uh, there's always the third element, which is the mother, and the, uh, that it, that triangle has obsessed me for twenty years or so. <laughs> Maybe longer. Very interesting. Mm. Um, th there's an element in poetry, for me anyway, that is that is always reaching, um, whether it be for clarity or understanding or to find pieces in a jigsaw puzzle to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what, if anything, your poems about your father are reaching for. Well, I I think it goes back to again an, an impulse to to. Uh, to tell tell a story, uh, it's simply that. I mean, to to tell a story, but also uh, to understand for myself uh, who he was. Uh, I'm interested in in truth, in a sense. I was interested um, to know a bit more about his own parentage, his own ancestry, the influence of his, you know, Scott. They're Scots. Anglo Scots uh, and and uh, uh, ancestry, which goes back to eighteen fifty in Melbourne. And though his great grandfather was uh, the, a, a migrant from Scotland, who founded Victoria Bitter, the the beer company. By the way, <laughs> so I'm a long lost uh, descendant of a beer baron, um, but that. You know this this whole thing about his parentage. I didn't know until I started writing and researching his life in about two thousand. 
um and it, this book is 2020 isn't it 21 yeah. so that's 21 years of of reflection poetry though for me is is more to do with the capturing the small elements the small moments or the small epiphanal uh details of someone's life it's not really the same as a biography of someone you know i'm not trying to completely encapsulate my father in one book uh like a novelist would would uh, i don't have that ambition <laughs> no no it's impossible I... anyway um so poetry for me is that it is still something that captures fragments captures uh enlightenment but in a sort of small ordinary way yeah. i guess i'm interested in the in the psychology and the dynamic of of the relationship mm. uh, and uh because i you know I, i've been involved in a men's group um for mm. many years and um uh, when, when we started out it was going to be about talking about grief but we spent the first year talking about our fathers a whole year of it talking about our fathers and mm. esteem and it, it's very central i think to the to a lot of men's lives, <laughs> what to do with the father and how to understand the father. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think, I think uh, me too. And the poem, you know, we, I'll read it later, but the poem where he's uh, basically dying in hospital is, yeah. is, is part of that. Um, uh, try to process the, the relationship up to that point and then move on. But I wanted to capture uh that that time before he died i didn't want it to be all retrospective uh and that's the thing about literature you can make the past seem present uh, mm. um and and i think yeah i wanted my book to be something that would be relevant to to you or to people uh who who need to do to talk about their fathers and uh you know, I think also there was a a feeling I'd, I'd uh, uh, I wanted to um, offer something a bit more uh, nuanced than 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 something mythologizing our fathers. I think there's a lot of it's very easy just to say, "Oh, he was a great great guy. He taught me everything I knew, and uh, he was my hero." But that's part of it because uh, you grow up as most children grow up naturally uh, wanting to to uh, love their father, and then sometimes things go well, and sometimes they don't go so well. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, it's funny. Yeah, I, I've never belonged to a men's group, but this is sort of my uh, my men <laughs> my own chat with myself. It's actually yeah. also. It's also a, a way of displacing all the things I wanted to say or felt, uh, which I could never say because I was too afraid to say a lot of things. About yeah, my uh, that's exactly what I was going to talk about because um, I, w I was wondering how, how you, you would characterize it, whether you would say it was the poems are an effort to resolve unresolved aspects of your relationship with him or, or a way of having conversations with him that you never had mm. or, or, or a tribute to him or... Mm. an expression of love or everything and more well, all of those yeah uh definitely uh, sort of having conversations that i never had uh and as a as someone who is a biographer of him uh i had to have con more conversations but it was very difficult because he he was quite reticent in, in his later years mm. and yeah not not if he found it almost impossible to to just relax and talk uh completely unlike my mother by the way who who just uh it, it's the opposite um yeah and also yeah the sort of one has guilt you always have guilt that you didn't do this or you didn't do that or guilt that you actually did you know i've 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 gone over through my mind all the things I could have done or, you know, regret is, is very much part of the background mood. And so is apart from grief, but regret or try, uh, I wouldn't say guilt in the Catholic or religious sense, 
uh, because we're not Catholics either. I mean, it's not guilt in the eyes of God or anything like that. Uh, it's more like, well, I had all that time. <laughs> Did we do the right thing or could we have done more? Uh, and so literature allows that space to contemplate the what could have been as well. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the the the, the biography, um, and uh, I was wondering whether with the biography and this book you've exhausted the theme, if you like, or is it something that's just going to keep on giving for years to come? Uh yeah. I've, I've been yeah silent about. I haven't really written much in the last couple of years. Um, there is uh, one feeling is I just want to leave it at that. Uh, I don't know what more, but, you know, just going through these poems again for this, to prepare for this, uh, sort of brought, brought up the creative rewriting or the new writing where, you know, I actually changed a few lines, but we can talk about that where I've, felt that the my re new revision was much clearer than before so that's mm. nice so mm. if it's if it's if i come up with more stuff about about him particularly um that's okay i mean it's yeah um it goes against my other impulse which is to just move on <laughs> we all want to move on uh that's probably another thing about the ghost the the revenants theme the title of the book revenance uh it ghostliness is also memory that haunts you so and stays uh, with you stays with you yeah you yeah. have to live with you have to as you have to live with the dead whether they're yours or not <laughs> embrace your ghosts adam yeah that's sort of that idea and without getting too depressed about it i mean it, there has to be some some uh uh what's the word when you you know uh you feel released from things catharsis catharsis yeah it's an old it's an old cliche about writing you know you write to to feel freer and all that stuff yeah well you work through stuff I yeah think. you work through and you feel better yeah <laughs> that is a psychological I... therapeutic thing yeah I, I was asked that once about writing the biography was it was it therapeutic and i at that time i said emphatically no because it was too i didn't feel very cured of anything i just felt felt uh it was too hard yeah yeah shall we read some poems yeah sure yeah yeah we're going to start off with the uh first poem in the book yeah that's christmas singapore 1957 much better than that Melbourne day in 56. So my father wrote in blue fountain pen on airline parchment to his mother, Jean. Apro time, then English goose plus trimmings, a bottle of BOAC Bordeaux, two ant antacid for dessert, all in best company. It's a great so, to introduce the book, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's you can't from listening you can't tell what's italicized, but the first two lines much better than that Melbourne Day in fifty six. That's uh, that's it's italicized because it it's a paraphrase of what my father wrote in a letter. Mm. So that's literally what he did, and the the ap apro time. And that menu and what he ate um, was all in that too, um, mm. uh, more or less. I mean, I'm not claiming. So I didn't, you know, <laughs> all the controversies about plagiarism are very, very important to know there. But uh, what I wanted to do and what I've done a bit in other poems is uh, appropriate or use his, his voice. Mm. or his textual voice, the the evidence in his letters, which I was able to read. Mm. Um, and and uh, the, a lot of the discussion, with John Kinsella, especially in a review, was talking about how I do, how I use it, how it's, and its effects on the reader. But in this one, it's the first one, it's quite simple. It's just 
it introduces him um time is the past a bit a bit uh colonial um the mother is there um and the i think the tone of youthful you know happiness is great <laughs> So yeah. it's a good one to start with. Yeah. Well, it, it interests me for a couple of reasons. One is that it obviously dates back to 1957, and it's before you were born. Mm. And, uh, and I was born in 19. I was born in 1960 for the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and so you're not. He's writing to his mother, so it's, he he's directing it, you know, to his mother, mm. and now you're his child. Uh, revisiting it if you like mm, mm, but of mm. course he, he would not have had you in mind when he wrote it um mm. uh so i'm in i'm intrigued i'm intrigued by that by by you know you're finding something from before you were born before you before you existed and and um, mm. and how that resonates but uh it made me ask the the question uh whether the the poems in this book about him are chronological is that how you ordered them or uh yeah yeah um, yeah, originally in that earlier drafts, so uh, they weren't very chronological. And um, working with my editor at Girimondo, Lisa Gordon, um, she helped me figure out the the overall order. And it is important uh, that it is chronological. It it does. It's just something we're used to as readers, I think, as well. So you know, like uh, uh, you don't have to start right at the beginning um you can have a sort of you can start at the end and look back from there um but this didn't this seemed fresher to just start there mm. and, and let the reader start somewhere solid uh, in a way time wise quite mm. there's no playing around with time here <laughs> no so um, how did you find that letter uh well it was controversial i I had negotiations with my father about whether I could read his letters and there was a lot of misunderstanding and, uh, um, you know, the, he, at one point he did, he, he did give me permission and later he said he didn't give me permission. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, a difficult one there. Um, uh, yeah, that's the answer to that one. And sort of what other source materials did you use to write the poems about him? Oh, um, not really that many other source materials. My mother's my mother's uh, stories as well. Her her oral history is very important, but that that's not so much in this book. Uh, not so much in these poems. Mm. Um, I mean, there's again. I just want to. Uh, say that a lot of the poems are, are kind of uh are not strictly biographical I, in, you know, i'm not saying i'm making stuff up i, I really oh. don't believe in making mm -hmm. making stuff up but i we'll look at that later how how things become more textually complicated and 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 vague yeah well i mean yeah. the, the trick in poetry is not just what you put in but what you leave out isn't it yeah, well, that's very, very. I was thinking of that last night. As my next book is going to be on partly on that theme of what you leave out. Um, uh, we, yeah, it just came to me. Uh, what isn't there? How do you how do you indicate what isn't there? Um, and what isn't there is what wasn't said. Mm. But that's easier to deal with in the, in the prose than in poetry. I think mm. for me, anyway. Uh, oh, I guess I mean in my poetry what's not said is you just you don't you don't fill in the gaps too much so it's a paratactic you know it's cut and paste in a way this is a cut and paste um but the, the simplest way of doing it is the first poem yeah um i mean this is a fragment very very small fragment mm. of a glimpse of your father in 1957 how mm. how does that fragment of a glimpse reconcile with the man you later knew uh Oh, well, again, uh, that's very, very difficult to say. Um, okay, the man the man I knew before, do you mean before I, I re read these these letters? 
Oh, I think it. He was still the man uh, I grew up with, but it helped me understand where he'd come from and what an interesting life he'd had. I mean, it certainly made him a more complex person to my mind. It, I also understood, in a sense, his losses because his mother died in 1959 or 58. I'm not sure. And these were the last letters that he, he wrote. Mm. So that's partly why, paradoxically, he did want me to understand him through those, but also didn't want to reveal them. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and he was very conscious that I'd get it, I'd, I'd misrepresent him as a colonial um, uh, flaneur or, you know, a flake or something, which is not what I wanted to do at all. Uh, but that just showed, again, he was a very sensitive and fragile person. He had very, uh, with a lot of grief. He had a lot more grief than I realised. <laughs> mm, that's interesting. Yeah. interesting to know. Um, I, I'm also interested to know how you go about selecting extracts um, of his letters for your, for your poems. I mean, do, do mm. some things jump out at you as, oh, this will be good for a poem? Or is was there a sort of hard sifting process, thinking carefully about what to use and what not to use? Oh, I, definitely sifting. I mean, yeah, uh, you go through the the usual thing of a scholar would, you know, read, take notes, make sure that uh, some things are quoted properly. Uh, I'm just saying that for the students. <laughs> uh, then just things that you want to save are things that keep coming back to you like the apro time but maybe i maybe that's my voice and i've maybe it isn't very accurate he didn't say apro time um but he did say english goose plus trimmings i remember it very clearly because of the plus he used notation yeah. he loved doing lists he liked you know he did these are just what one of the things he one of the lists what he ate but he did lists of what he wanted to buy lists of gifts he was going to bring back from Hong Kong to Melbourne one day. Very long lists. Um, what was in his flat. Uh, he A bit kind of OCDC. OEC. OCD. Yeah, my, father, my father was a bit like that too with his lists. Um, so. yeah, and, and also people like him always carried a pen and paper and they were always writing stuff. So, and he was a, my father was a good graphic designer so he used to draw stuff in his letters and um as well so yeah it's an insight into into his sort of creative mind his complex uh view of the world he, viewing the world through lists or through you know he even wrote down what time exactly he he was writing the letters you know that's a i've seen that in some poetry too mm. Um, did he die before um, you wrote these poems so he didn't get a chance to read them or did he read some of them? Well, he, he to be honest, this parts of this poem occur uh, occur in the, the memoir, 100 Letters Home. Hmm. Um, and he did read that, yeah. So he read some of it. But this book came out after he died, so... Mm. unfortunately mm. um i don't think i could have written it before he died um anyway so mm. um all right should we have another yeah. poll the next one's it's more or less the same but this time i'm in it it's called cognac and cigars i am standing alone in the northeast monsoon and the whole nation misses me my cup needs filling Instant noodles, window shut, aircon on, Gowloon patterns, tea dipped clouds, smog sunset. Your view in 56 above the throng, all your past, my past, lost in letters. You got drunk in 57, fell in love in 58. At the Foreign Correspondence Club, you wagered on a horse with an Irish name. The stake was cognac and cigars. Last week, you swapped the lucky digger's hat, your grandfather's, 
for Dutch clogs. No luxury you can't have. You push a button, I imagine, myself as you, and a boy runs into the room, lighter at the ready. Yeah. So I, I hope that's clear what's going on there. <laughs> um, uh, to make it even clearer, just to add a little detail, I have I actually spent a few weeks in in Hong Kong as, on a writer's residency, and so I, I I was imagining, even at that time, I was imagining what my father's life in Hong Kong was like in that at that time. So this poem sort of merges my uh, experience in Hong Kong with with what I knew about his life there as well so his his short sojourn i call it sojourn there he, he was yeah. in hong kong um that was one of his first jobs with an advertising agency um and uh he actually wrote about this in a letter as well that his he wrote about his first flat in hong kong and how amazing it was that he could could have a servant who could just run into the room and light his cigarettes. I mean, he, it was it, it was a sort of naive pleasure at the, the post-colonial <laughs> um, situation for foreign white foreigners, you know, especially business people. Um, so that that does introduce that whole thing about the colonial relationships between being Westerners and locals. No, very lightly. Mm. Uh, the I am standing alone is is you, is it? Well, it, it's um, it is, uh, but it could be him. <laughs> yeah, because I I kind of read it as, as 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 him, and that when you get to the next stanza, your view in fifty six above the throng. Yeah, so, so um, I saw that, and I, and I I was struck by the opening lines, uh, and the whole nation misses me. Mm. Um, and I, I was wondering uh, why, why, why it's yeah. the nation misses me and not yeah, something well, yeah, what personal. What was that about? Um, well, okay, it in a sense it's a very egotistical position. <laughs> if it's me, I am standing alone. It's it's my sense that that uh, I'm writing for the nation, which is a very sort of it's a, it's a bit of satire or mock, self mockery really okay. I, I think that's an irony of course why would i'm not that you know famous but it, it's a pose and i i sort of i do that it's the ironic pose self deprecating thing that i i tend to do you know um you think you're so important <laughs> um that the whole nation misses you it can be very easily misconstrued, um, can't it? I mean, arrogance. <laughs> yeah, well, you, well, you could read it as a colonialist attitude, uh, for one thing, or you could read it as arrogance or hubris or or, or something, egotism. Mm. Um, I think I, I'd like it to be re read as a sort of self-deprecating uh, irony, uh, yeah. and but also to 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 make fun of of the whole the whole genre you know of the white the white colonial writing back to his writing back to the to the center if you if you know much about post-colonial literary theory uh you know it, there's a whole lot of colonial writing that addresses addresses doesn't address the place they're in it addresses or the people locals because the locals are treated as the other but it's writing back to to mother or writing back to father or writing back to your nation mm. uh it's all part of earlier explore exploration narratives as well and that's part part of you know my interest uh, literary interest in in, in travel narratives mm. especially colonial ones and i did do a lot of research on australian obscure australian writers who who wrote wrote about uh, Asian countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, and a lot of them w had that attitude. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in this terrible place. Uh, it's, it's disgusting. And, you know, 
uh, some of them are more, more, more positive and ambivalent, which we can get into later. Uh, you know, oh, I hate this place, but I love the women or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a trope. Yeah. Uh, and it, rather than condemn it and get really indignant, indignant about it, which is fine, uh, you can call things out like that and, and, en and enjoy your textual interference with it. Mm. I think it's that's what it is. It's a kind of kind of intervention and a textual displacement and upsetting of that whole thing. The whole nation misses me. Mm. Did your father <laughs> regard himself as a connoisseur of food and wine? Uh, at that time, it's it, well. At at that time, yeah. He was interested, but um, in in his letters, he talks about, you know, beer, for example. He says, you know, you can get beer in bottles in Hong Kong. And that really surprised me. Uh, I think it's in another poem or text somewhere. Um, and I realised, wow, he was quite, quite interested in what he was consuming. And, uh, you know, as a traveller and a privileged white man you're the ultimate consumer so he wanted to write back to his mom and tell her what he what what was new and interesting for him and it was yes he he also said some nasty things i think which sound nasty now but you know about um sort of bad bad foreigners food that that was for foreigners, but not the real stuff. So at that time he was, and then as as we grew up, he he loved he loved to talk about food. He loved food. Um, uh, there, was, there, there was an appeal for him in cognac and cigars. Oh yeah, he loved. Well, this was his first paying job, so he had he could have suddenly afford these luxuries. To put in a bit of background, he 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 didn't grow up uh, a, a wealthy. Man, I mean, his family were what I'd say middle class, but they they had been very a very wealthy family, but that had all disappeared after World War One, after World War Two, and and then his mother had to divorce, and he grew up a sort of sort of I wouldn't say in poverty, but I'd say deprived, lower by 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 middle class standards at the lower end financially, but culturally very very much of a kind of elite, you know, he used to, his mum and him would go and love to listen to opera and um, they played golf, they had golf memberships, but they could hardly afford them. Um, my father hated me mentioning that. He once said I was never middle class. <laughs> he'd forgotten, he'd forgotten um, a lot of things. He said I was never that kind of foreign, I was never a snob and all that stuff but i wanted to capture what what happens to a young man suddenly with all this money which is what kind of happened to me the first time i worked in i worked as a teacher in indonesia and i was suddenly it felt i had all this immensely greater purchasing power and choice and privilege and all that stuff yeah Though I, 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 much more. I was much more conscious than him of what it means to be a privileged Westerner. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm more worried about it than he was. I think at the time. Yeah. I'm interested in the lines uh, towards the middle of the poem. All your past, my past, lost in letters. Mm. I think the sense of letters meaning writing. Yeah, not literally letters, but they are lost in a way. Uh, no one reads actual physical letters except researchers. Um, so, but also it also means lost can be recovered. So lost can be found. I think that's what I'm setting up here at the beginning of the book. I'm going to find some more of this past. Right. Without saying it. Yeah, but you're also making a link between his past and your past and how those past oh yeah intersect. oh yeah yeah exactly exactly i think yeah that's a uh, that's that's something i've been do 
had been doing a lot in, in this book and it's quite aware of it, this, this play on pronouns, your, my, I, you. Um, and sometimes part of my composing process is working out which pronouns I'm, I want to use, especially if it's really a simple poem about myself and that with a relationship between my, myself and someone else or between two people. You and you and he, you and she, uh, me and you, <laughs> uh, and it fits in into a nice line um, mm. with the co the comma again, uh, visually very neat and tidy and easy. <laughs> I mean, th there's an argument, isn't there, that the past is inherently lost? Mm. Yeah. Good point. Um, it is, and I, obviously, every every moment uh, comes after the lost one before. You know, it's quite frightening. We're all our path is being lost instantaneously, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and, and but and, we and create um, around trying to retrieve it. Yeah, um, but in writing, it's different because you can you can reimagine and reinscribe the past as the present. Um, and this is why why you write this is written uh, you can do that I'm standing alone that's present you got drunk in 57 that's past um, okay they're in relationship with each other so yeah the past and the present seem to be opposites but they're not they're complementary they speak to each other you know they're part um, of a continuum yeah um and and the the writer's job, I think, is to move between them uh, and to make it the movement to be to be to be uh, navigable. Yeah, uh, to, to be smooth. <laughs> I like I like it to be a bit more smooth, like a movie. I love this is a very visual. Uh, one of my favorite filmmakers is. Um, uh, Marguerite Duras, not the filmmaker, but the it's called Hiroshima Monomore. It does that all the time, but it's a moving montage of things going back, forward. Uh, so last week uh, is obviously his last week, not my last week. <laughs> mm. You know, you push a button, that's back to present again. Uh, I guess some some poetry writers would say don't don't mix up all your tenses and confuse the reader i think that's in a way good good advice when you're starting out um you can mix up the reader you can get into terrible confusion especially in prose um, there are rules you know there are conventions that which i've been exploring and experimenting with uh, mm. Um, just t speaking more generally about these poems, um, are they, and, and, and the way we're talking about time and the past and how it disappears, are these poems a kind of acknowledgement that the life led by your father uh, mm. before you were born is essentially impenetrable? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, when, after he died, I was much more aware of, well, now it really is in, impenetrable, you can't ask much more uh you can't really verify anything <laughs> um except with people who knew him uh or, you know or knew, if you're talking about your father you, you you find out more through others um but then that leaves that core of someone completely gone yeah i suppose yeah yeah i mean yeah. legally speaking you never the the truth ends up being always uh, mediated. Yeah, uh, once well, someone's gone, they can't be a first person witness to their own life or to their life with you, uh, which is sort of melancholic, really. It's sad, but uh, again, that's we what that's what you get. That's what we we end up with. Yeah. So why worry about it in a way? Yeah. Uh, um, uh but it actually, you, as a as a writer, it gives you room to move in a way because w what is known about the life is so scanty as to render it a kind of a mirage um, mm. in the haze of the past that you can't see clearly. But 
but mm. but that gives you license as a writer to explore mm. and imagine doesn't it yeah and i think i think uh we have to we have to allow that i mean well, the controversy about e dark emu for example i mean uh the the horrific uh, criticisms of of uh bruce pasco bruce pasco's uh uh reliability uh, at, uh out of place because reliability i mean it's, a lot of stuff wasn't written down but it only seems to be western positivist uh colonial um standards that that uh, insist on this you know was did it really happen or did it not if you can't prove it didn't happen it didn't happen i mean that's extremely binary and extremely unfair to uh the way uh, the place that our inheritance our knowledge comes from uh, and and i'm you know this is it it's it's you have to give writers some sort of license to imagine and to to speculate to assert, you know and to but as, to acknowledge that this is there isn't the the whole gamut of of, of uh, evidence in in the legal sense, and it, and it can still yeah. be a truth. It 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 can still be a, a truth, a truth, a kind of truth, without getting to postmodern. <laughs> it's 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 a testimonial a, a truth. You know, if some someone says, "Yeah, the stories that came down to me told me this," uh, they have to have some value. Maybe not the truth is. Not so much the test, but the value, um, mm. the value to your identity, to your sense of who you are, where you came from, perhaps, uh, and where you're going to go next with it. So mm. uh, the past isn't dead because it's the past in a, in that sense. It is it is ultimately unknowable uh, the way the way we know that this, it's sunny today or something. Mm. Um, yeah. so, but it's all in the background of my work this this uh it, the work about that's uh, memoir based uh these issues of course I, I wrestled with when i was writing the memoir and st studying for my doctorate and all that you know uh and that and i've always been interested in in sort of creative non-fiction but i mean this is I don't know if this my poetry fits any kind of clear definition of what creative nonfiction is, but um, and of course you, I can always I, I admit it I, put me up there it you can't I can't prove he said anything <laughs> that he said um, but I can say that uh, my intention was it, my intention has always been honourable and uh, yeah ultimately intention like with my father is to uh love love his legacy not not to, to condemn it whatsoever mm. without being sentimental and that's something i'm struggle with a lot what is sentiment what is too sentimental what is what is actually moving you know mm. yeah we can have another conversation about yeah. that <laughs> just move on a little bit yeah uh, i was going to say one more thing about this poem and um a as a reader of poetry i can imbue lines with all kinds of meanings for example i can read the line no no luxury you can't have uh, as a critique of colonialism mm -hmm. or, or as a wistful ah those were the days or or as a oh, judgment yeah. a judgment of the man or as something that seems inconceivable now um when you when oh, you yeah. when you write a line like that, do you want it to have multiple potential meanings, or do you have a particular meaning that you're trying to convey? Oh well, no, no, I I, I go for uh, full spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't even think too much about it. I I I didn't think about it as wistful, but it is wistful, um, and I didn't think of it as condemnatory. Uh, I it's what it is uh it's a fact a fact a fact at the time uh it's a 
it is something it, it, it doesn't exist anymore that's uh possibly something to regret or it could be uh, uh maybe that's a good thing we don't have this this privilege anymore at mm. the expense of someone else mm. though i'm i'm not i'm not didactic uh that's pro probably why people find my work difficult they think oh i don't know how to take that line does it is it it's so it's so um uh ambiguous or and and i, I know i know that can be a problem with it sometimes mm. i'm not sure myself uh I mean, I like, I like as a reader, I like having the room to move and mm. having, you know, all those possibilities in play. Yeah, it, it does. It does present a problem when you're reading out loud. Um, you know, how an actor might say, how am I going to say that line? What tone? I mean, I try to indicate with, 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 with the poetic, um, uh, emphasis no luxury you can't have or no luxury you can't have i mean you i'm not a formalist it's not a verse line so it doesn't have to it can be read both ways uh free verse does that but you push a button obviously you push a button that's that's quite clear it's just a a movement to the next line i imagine myself as you i think the dash has to be there to give that I imagine myself as you. Hmm. If you take out the dash, I imagine myself as you. I mean, however you want to read it. But the yeah, the punctuation is my it's important. So for me, reading out loud isn't my great great strength. Uh um and I did read a lot of early, you know, Carlos Williams and the Imagists and and all of that, which is um and i've i've always loved i've loved that kind of uh that kind of um emphasis on on minimal lines but i i uh with the control that you you exert with with punctuation so hmm. yeah all right should we read another one yep okay Gentleman in the parlor after Somerset Maugham. Uh, Somerset Maugham being um, a very famous early 20th century or mid 20th century uh, English writer who spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and other places. I read my father's letter on Hong Kong, how he loved it, the heat, the beer in bottles, the tailoring, the freedom I imagine him reading Somerset Maugham with the temperature at 105, waited on by one silent, in italics, Chinese boy, sick, who lights his cigarettes, Eastern food and chopsticks. If you can't use them, you can't eat. Dense traffic and a ceaseless din. My father writes what he wants his mother to know. I won't know if my father thought what Maugham wrote. The East, a malaise, unredeemed by divine nostalgia. Although I know my father grew tired of tinned pears and breakfast sausage. My father was not English, not Maugham. For Masterton, Maugham's hero, an English stream had a smiling nonchalance, and on some island of tigers, his only fear was a reckless motorist or the fury of a woman scorned. I took to the road once more, one day followed another with a monotony in which was nothing tedious. Masterton recorded in shorthand a small boy and his buffalo in an avenue in the park of a deserted monarch. He called it a ruined city. Everywhere Masterton saw the assimilated and the defeated Khmer living in art under awnings on a terrace. My father went dancing and ordered new suits and dresses for mum. 
with an innocent Dubonnet before lunch, he read the advertisements and gauged the fate diverse of the colony. When the coolies hammered on the door, the sleepwalking servant answered it. An orient crowd was a bed of daffodils at a market gardener's, brilliant but monotonous. Bugles blew, and we, the Europeans, crowded into the throne room. Two soldiers dressed in orange. Masterton slept right through the night. His cup of tea was cold. His pipe had fallen out of his mouth. His hire car was waiting at the door. So this poem follows immediately from, on from Cognac, Cognac and Cigars. Mm. Um, in that poem, you imagined yourself as your father. In this one, you imagine your father reading Somerset Maugham. Uh, I wanted to ask you what what is the function of imagination in these poems? Is it is it to try to enter your father's life or to visualize what that life might have been like, or are you invoking imagination for a different purpose? Um, well, uh, yeah, I think I'm imagining. I'm imagining. I'm saying I imagine him because I can't, in a sense, literally say he did read this book. And I can't really say what he thought of the book. Um, so I have to give myself room um, to, to comment and, and in a sense, uh, displace or, or upset that, that Orientalist colonial um, racism, etc. But I don't want, I definitely don't want to, um, and it's clear, I, my father was not English and not more. I wanted I wanted to sort of place him in a framework where he's surrounded by um, this kind of attitude or these attitudes these 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 Western snobby attitudes, but I wanted him to be free of it in a sense outside the frame as well, like I'm outside the fr of that time, um, and um, it, it's just it gives me a sense uh, and uh, it allows me to cut and paste again i wasn't sure really it was a bit of an experiment as well and i wasn't sure i could keep all of this together so it's gone through quite a lot of drafts and and then this is the one that i ended up with um and uh yeah and also to say i imagine him you can also go on to the next expression i won't know again yeah. uh again the sort of displacing my own authority i think that's important in this in this um um in this poem to 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 not come across as judgmental i don't i don't want to be to come across as author, authoritative or didactic um, um but it, at the same time i really enjoyed ventriloquizing more um yeah and 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 Too imagining bad. my father falling asleep just like masterson does so my father in a way it's a bit of a sort of magic realist trick uh, my father is reading mom and suddenly my father becomes masterton the character in the mom it's it's yeah. it's a it's a latin magic realist transformation and um you can do that you can do that with film you can do that with poetry slippage yeah yeah and and it's fun um was your father a reader oh yeah yeah he did like reading a lot yeah um he uh yeah he had a, a pretty big library he yeah i think uh he, he wasn't a reader the way my my mother was he didn't read he had a lot of literature and he but he interesting he read a lot of stuff that men tend to read even now like spy thrillers and uh the more popular stuff non-fiction history you know he had the the history history of of you brit great britain by winston churchill not winston churchill this or his winston churchill's son or whatever these books were all in his library but um yeah so he had that that kind of he didn't read a huge amount of poetry or or i don't think he even read a lot of novels either mm. 
but he but he loved it. He loved uh, you know James Bond and uh, uh, um, you know those that that genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's common to recognise some of our own traits, good or bad, as having been transmitted to us from our parents. When when you interrogate your father's life in these poems, I suppose in, I don't not sure if interrogate is the right word, but when you reflect on your father's life in these poems, what do you see of yourself? Well, yeah, this one, uh, I see myself um, again. I'm the I'm the reader. I'm reading about. I'm reading a letter and uh, re transmitting that. Um, I'm also partly him. I mean, I mean, I did mention that before that I, 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 I followed in his footsteps as a traveller, and also worked overseas in in Southeast Asian countries, and um, and it, in a sense, yeah. Simply put, I've been obsessed by that question too. What is it about me that's was comes from him? Um, what did what is it about him that's in me and that that never goes away uh, i mean physically we're half of a <laughs> genetically uh, yeah. but you know if we think about you know am i also obsessed with lists in a way yeah um i do keep lists my poetry's re recycling lists um i i like luxuries i like I, i'm hedonistic uh um yeah, all of those things. Uh, I feel, I feel ambivalent about my place in the world. Uh, I feel, I feel. I, I, he he was very very reflective. I think he was also. He he suffered from depression. I suffer from depression. Mm. Um, I suffer from a sense of being, being, uh, not not successful. <laughs> uh he he suffered from that all his life he always wanted to be a, a ceramic artist he he never got to do that really fully uh though he he, he was a he would he loved to see himself as a connoisseur of things um maybe he was a bit of a snob as well in, in about certain things he could be very very savage on on people he didn't like and uh, people he thought had crossed him and uh yeah those things they, it does weigh on my mind yeah yeah um I, I was wondering to what extent you know the search for your father through poetry is also a search for yourself oh yeah well that's that's right and that's there are there are lines that um that indicate that here and there um where where um, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I'm saying something about him is actually about me too. So, you know, um, the, the, the relationships with women are very important, but I don't really cover that as much in these. No. Uh, and obviously I'm a different generation. So, yeah. yeah. You're right. Uh, my father writes what he wants his mother to know. Ah, right. I yeah. love that line. I love that. Don't yeah. we write what we want? <laughs> what we we hold back. Uh, we write what we want people to know, and 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 we say we want people to know. The inference, though, mm. that there's so much else that he didn't want his mother to know that remains unknown. Is, is that? Oh, a yeah, yeah. He, as I said, he, um, you know, uh, he. he he had to do that. I think it's his private life that he had some of the things he, but he was remarkably, remarkably frank about what he did. It's almost, uh, you know, uh, even what time he got home and which, which ladies he went out with. I mean, she, she wanted to know she was, she and he shared a lot. They were very, very close. They were almost like lovers, you know, in a way. Um, but at times, I think he 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 wanted to make her feel happy. So uh, again, I wouldn't know if he left out stuff. Uh, how would I know? Well, <laughs> that's it, right. it, I mean, 
he didn't want to incriminate himself. <laughs> Not that he did anything criminal, as far as I know. <laughs> it's all uh, a bit of it gets all a bit labyrinthine, you know. Yeah. What, what, but that's fun. That's the fun part of this poem. The no word comes up. N K N O W. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that Maugham lived in the middle of the 20th century. I suppose his life overlapped your father's to a considerable extent. Hmm. Uh, is is the reference to Maugham in this poem a way of evoking a colonial life and making a correlation between your father's life and the sort of lives depicted in Maugham's novels? Well, not, not, um, probably not that, not that um, clearly, not that deliberately. Um, it has to be, it, again, it's just a, it's sort of background colour to his life. But, mm. but my intention really is to, is, is part of my own, yeah, my, part of my own uh, reaction, my own response to Somerset Maugham's texts, <laughs> his stories, uh, how, how racist they are. And, uh, and uh, me, you know, I want to call it out, but, but also I want to ventriloquize it as well. And I, this is a strange thing that it's, it's it's a tactic or strategy for decentering colonial discourse, if you want to put it in that kind of language, mm. is to ventriloquize the person you're trying to bring down. Um, you know, mockery basically. Mm. And I found that this 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 worked for me. This poem I could defuse more. Um, at the same time, laugh you know laugh at his his anachronistic syntax in which was nothing tedious. I mean, even at his time of writing, that was completely uh, Edwardian and marked <laughs> and out of place. And he was anachronistic. And I just laughed at it. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it's harmless in a way. If it's left in a book, it's harmless. But if, if Maugham, if, you, if, if all the colonials thought like Maugham, and many of them you know, hated, hated, uh, you know, it's violence, co colonial violence through text, colonial violence through racism. It affects me. And, and I, it, it still affects me. And I still, it's part of my uh, writing mission is, is to address that. Uh, All right. Do you want to read another one? Hmm. And I guess Luang Prabang, it's a, a, a different approach to the same issues. Uh, by the way, Luang Prabang is the now very uh, popular uh, tourist destination in northern Laos, and a beautiful Buddhist town, Buddhist, full of Buddhist statues. A Frenchman taught my mother to eat baguettes. He gave her French, and she saved him her furious back chat. He gave her a poetic, how the hour to be shot at dawn was as beautiful as the sun that wakes behind the clouds. He taught her ways to roast pigeon and how to know the romance of the words, how to read Flaubert and Proust, how to say tenebreuse et tendre l'affectueuse. From him she learned inflections and improved her monsoonal lassitude. She could teach him where there were caves the rebels hid in. Here are the bomb casings. Sorry, where the bomb casings lay. In a dangerous field and the baguettes, how they were filled with canned pâté. Sir, this is your rocking chair, your beautiful hotel. Here is the dawn, the procession and the bowl for arms. And this is the way of giving that sets us free. There is a white straw hat and you taught her sisters to weave. Sorry, there was there a white straw hat you taught her sisters to weave. And under it, that man who forgets dismay sleeps again, one eye open in the shade of his charming decay in a glorious swelter in the imageless afternoon. The Frenchman who was not my father. You've done something remarkable in this poem, I think, anyway. 
Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so the poem is really about your mother. Yeah. Until the very last line. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. The Frenchman well, who is who is not my father, uh, yeah. and then your father sort of makes an entrance, um, mm. obliquely makes an entrance, but it completely changes the entire poem. I mean, if you had written that poem without mm. that last line, it would be a completely different poem. Mm. Well, um, funny, th funny thing was, um, David, uh, last night I was looking through drafts and to find the ones in the book, and I couldn't find the electronic one, so I had to rewrite. That's why I made a mistake, I think. I uh, retranscribed Luang Prabang from my book into this. The one in this is the the one in the book basically, with the last line, but all the early drafts don't have that that last line. So this last line probably got in at the last moment. Yeah, um, I think it's incredible because it focuses the entire poem. Mm. Though it's not about him on him, mm. um, and. Uh, mm. It, it's a. It, it makes the poem a kind of slight sl sleight of hand. Um, <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, it is. It is. A sleight um, of hand. It's. It's a. It's a seduction uh, with a, with a message at the end, kind of thing. Yeah. Or, a, yeah, like yeah, it's it's going on along, and you think it's it's all about this, but then the sheet's taken away. <laughs> um, <laughs> is the is this poem? In in one respect about provenance, how how if things had gone a different way with this Frenchman, your mother would not have ended up with your father and you would not have been born. I mean Yeah, yeah, it's it's not important to know it for this one, but in the memoir there's a whole chapter about him, this this Frenchman. Um uh who she could have she fell in love with him, I think. And uh they could have. <laughs> They could have married and everything would have been different <laughs> um and uh the, the question in in the memoir I, I keep wrestling with what what would have have happened if i was the frenchman's son uh which is a sort of again a completely a literary device because of course it's i might not be who i am anyway so i wouldn't be who, who uh, it would be a, a different person yeah. altogether yeah, so it's an entry into a kind of fictive space. Um, and of course, I don't know much about this French and except what my mother told me about him, but he was, uh, he actually, he was Swiss French anyway, but not that that matters, but he was in Bangkok uh, around the same time in the fifth, late 50s. He was a businessman. Uh, he was, uh, there are pictures, photos of he, of him and my mother, and they're very happy together. And they they looked like they were in love, but at that time they were together. My father had to go away uh, on business, and in that time he was away, she went out with with him. Mm -hmm. I think they were friends anyway, but you mm -hmm. know they never. I don't think they became lovers, as far as I know, and it doesn't really matter if I know. Um, but he became an obsession of mine just through what my mother told me. And there were postcards that he sent to my mother, which I've seen, which say at the end, you know, I hope this gets to you on your birthday, bon fête okay. in French, beautiful French writing, and um, different, you know, the way they write, just the handwriting, the, the whole uh, romance of it. Yeah. Uh, and the whole romance theme uh, it was just, so beautiful to me and um, out of the romance is where they are isn't it yeah yeah and also my m own mother's propensity for foreign culture i mean it wasn't just he is a man um a sexual thing though i think it was obviously part of it but she was she was actually a student of french she read she read uh, French literature. She had French teachers. She really enjoyed them. She she also became a bit of a kind of snob, thinking that European and English culture were much more superior to Thai culture, even though Thailand was never colonised. I think in my mother's brain, and 
sense of values, she thought life in the West was going to be a lot better, uh, a lot more cultural. And, uh, and also, she obviously had a good life with these foreign men because they could take her to nice restaurants. And not that she cared much about that. But she she was she didn't have any money, and uh, she had a very nice social life with them, and never felt um, threatened by by them or yeah. um, oppressed by them. So that's another theme, of course, a, a big a big genre, you know, the, the, which are cross cultural relationships and yeah. white men and Asian women and that stuff. Um, I've, I've transposed that onto Luang Prabang because, again, it's my experience of being in Luang Prabang. I, I saw in the hotel this rather relaxed senior tourist and he had a white straw hat on and he was lying in his rocking chair in the hotel lobby and he looked, you know, he looked as happy as anything. Um, and there were, and there were, um, there was the procession. The whole Luang Prabang is a bit of a museum. It's sort of, it, they've they've preserved the middle of it. It's a UN place. They preserved it to be timeless, to be ancient. Um, uh, but you forget also. People don't. It's easy to forget. Laos was a. a, a there was a terrible war there, so the French were there, etc. Again. <laughs> not so important as far as poetry goes mm. um it's and the, i wanted this poem to feel lyric very lyrical and aesthetic and lassitude and i love that feeling of <laughs> relying la laying back and letting time disappear mm. um i mean i love that line her monsoonal lassitude mm. uh, mm. and her furious back chat um mm. That's, I'm not that's sure. the irony, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why, but for me, this poem, though it references Flaubert and Proust, mm. in its atmosphere, brings to mind The Lover by Marguerite de, Marguerite de Ras. Mm, mm. And also Graham Greene's The Quiet American, for some reason. Mm. I started visualizing. Oh, yeah, no, no, that's, I've read The Quiet American about seven times and watched the different various films, <laughs> versions, and taught it, and um fantastic book uh very very interesting book again you know it's got all the themes this um i couldn't put in uh i mean uh margaret Duras, the lover hadn't been written technically when when in the 50s i think it was written later uh, anyway doesn't matter um but yeah that's that's another of my favorite authors and i've read and taught that book the lover mm. many many times there, there's the exoticism of the colonial enterprise mm. yeah in the eastern underlying sense to me in, in, and and you capture it in the poem of of imminence and danger you know mm. of things about to happen you know where the bomb casings lay the caves mm. are in Mm. Uh, of people being thrown into situations outside their previously lived experience. Um, mm. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah, and um, um, I think that's um, that's that's a good point because you can't have one without the other. You can't have the the myth without the reality, the violence. Uh, um, you can you can ha you can ignore one side or the other, but it's much better to. To put them together and and, and put them against each other, hmm. uh, but again, not to be didactic. It's just uh, it's a question of leads to the question of well, how do we react to this to history? And you know, it's the same dilemma we have now. Um, it's very easy just to um, ignore one side of of exploit the exploitative. Uh, power relations and 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 enjoy it and aestheticize it all you know that's what what we've got tourism for <laughs> and you know in a sense i think that has to be there it's not that i say we should i'm not a puritan i'm not saying you know we shouldn't go to places like luang prabang i mean 
it's a fact there are there is there are um there are processions there there are beautiful temples there is contemplation there's peace etc etc so don't forget that too and that gives you hope in a way mm. um, um you you've mentioned your mother's sort of um interest in culture um and and the poem um points to you know cultural exchanges and a, a but a kind also a kind of cultural uncertainty i think that arises when cultures intersect mm. um oh. it, everything seems precarious and unresolved um mm. and i was wondering if this poem is also about what is unsaid between the lines as much as what is said because there's there's a lot unsaid here and mm. and if so is, is that a metaphor for your relationship with your father uh am i drawing too too long a bow there okay the, the, there's a lot of questions there yeah look the un uh yeah the the unsaid is is everything i've said in the background to this poem about the biography yeah about who he was and this frenchman was um and uh again if you put if i wanted a poem about all of that well, I've already written a chapter about it in prose. I don't want to go over mm. all of those things. Uh, but again, uh, metaphor for my father. Uh, not this poem. Not not particularly. I think I, I think the unsaid is that he he himself was uh, not not anything like uh, this this French person uh oh no that's not true actually uh the frenchman that was already married <laughs> and had a had a, a cambodian wife and two kids i forget forgot that my mother told me that um and that 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 casts another <laughs> another way of looking at it yeah i'm not sure how to answer that david a metaphor there are a lot of metaphors that my father can fit into the you know the colonialist um the uh the traveler uh the hedonist the party man uh they're all they're all stereotypes yeah that's one thing i i if you if you if you if you think of your subject in multiple metaphors and multiple comparisons you avoid the stereotypes and you start to get the complexity. Yeah. And which is something um I think a lot of poets need need to learn to do a bit more in Australia, I think, or everywhere. Stereotyping uh just when I feel a stereotype or I see one, i I feel disappointed. <laughs> mm. I feel like uh it's cartoonish rather than the and mm. complex mm. anyway we won't go there uh, so, uh, but it, it does explain my methodology a bit yeah. more yeah and, and i've mentioned you know the, the hints that you give you know her furious back chat um and then you don't go on with it you just leave it there for the for the reader to do what the reader can do mm. and and there's a sort of uh the man who forgets dismay uh this is they're wonderful lines but that mm. there's a lot underneath them um and, yeah. and so there's a tremendous amount of restraint in the writing here um was yeah. it hard not to elaborate on these things or 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 was it easy for you was that what you wanted to do to leave them there as rooms for readers to wander around in oh yeah good point um no i think earlier drafts have a lot more elaboration which i took out um i do like i, I do like those i do like um these sort of no lines that that suggests more <laughs> mm. what what was the one you just quoted the oh um the, the man who forgets dismay yeah the man who forgets dismay well i just like the the formalism of it i like the the right the internal rhymes i like the word dismay um i guess that's what's hinting at future disappointment but then i think once you've hinted at it yeah. Do we need to name the disappointment to come? Well, there's going to be disappointment. But until then, let's just relax. 
that's that's the that's that's the limit of the poem. It's saying I'm not going to go further today. I'm having a holiday kind of thing. <laughs> Let's go further into another poem. Marshall Surrett. Marshall Surrett cleans up Bangkok, 1959. At a corner table at the Hoi Tien Lao, my father dines with a better class of ladies who use spoon and fork, hold court with a French count flogging US Army surplus penicillin. In Chinatown, rounded up, the addicts led away and chained, the pipes all burned. Children running through the streets, naked no more. More white space in the Bangkok post, as if none of this had ever happened. I know what you're going to say. It's all about the white space or the, the unsaid. And this is about the unsaid. It's about censorship, of course. Uh, yeah. So I'll just explain Marshall Surrett, like a lot of um, leaders of Thai in 20th century Thai politics were, were from the army. So there was a, he was a, it was a, 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 a military um, dictatorship at the time led by Marshall Surrett. And Marshall Surrett, it was a, a sort of puritanical sort of <laughs> dictate. He did want to clean up Bangkok literally, uh, in a sense, culturally, get rid of the, the opium trade, which he did quite successfully, I think. Well, he got rid of the opium addicts in Chinatown. It took a lot, 20 more years to wipe out the opium trade in the north of Thailand. He also censored the newspapers. Uh, which happens today, of course, um, but more white space is, is was was the was what the newspaper had to do. It just leave white space mm. uh, rather than black space. Uh, um, the background Hoi Tien Liao Lao was a very famous Chinese Thai restaurant where a lot of expats went. I think that's pretty clear class better class of ladies um but there were also yeah people in in bangkok there's a huge black market in all sorts of u.s stuff uh what else um there was a sort of roundup of addicts they did burn pipes you know make, make big bonfires of opium pipes the children running through the streets naked no more well that's uh, obviously ironic because uh, I'm sure there were children still not, you know, whose parents didn't have enough money. So it's all about Bangkok slums and trying to cover that up, covering it up literally with clothes. <laughs> um, and it, so, placed, it yeah. placed your father as a witness to all of this. Mm, he was there. He was he was there, and and um, I know he was there because of the date, but also the yeah when this issue this happened, he was there. His also there's a one of his friends was uh, a, a a British Council lecturer or professor, D J Enright, who you might have heard of. D J Enright was a cultural. Uh, critic and a literary critic and a writer himself and he was very left-wing dj Enright was a lefty and he um was also a hedonist and also loved his opium apparently he admits all this in his own memoir and he he reports he writes an essay about how all this got cleaned up um and uh, he had to leave Bangkok in somewhat some disgrace for being too um, for encouraging Thai university students to think um, freely, <laughs> whatever that means. But there again, uh, unsaid, censored, vague, uh, scandalous. Uh, but all, um, all this all this happens around your father. 
but, but as I read the poem, he sort of carries on largely unperturbed and unaffected. Is is that right? Ah, uh, yeah. I I think I can get away with that because I never he never wrote about this himself. He he never he did write about you know how nice his his social life was, and he he would he would comment on the class of ladies. So he got he he had a list actually. Um, probably about 10 women that he'd gone out with or met or was interested in. Like, and he'd say, you know, number two, wife of uh, Swedish ambassador or number six, half, no, he didn't use the word half cuffs, but, you know, um, daughter of an Indian ambassador to, to Bangkok. He'd, he would encounter these people and uh and then he'd say things like would i go out with her probably not you know um she wouldn't or she he even commented to his to jean his mum that my mother did use spoons spoon and fork because something jean had said make sure make sure the women you go out with are, are cultured people that, that they eat with a spoon and fork or something and he he there's a line in his letter says you know dear mum um she she referring to my mother she does and underline does does use a spoon and fork um of course i can't prove all this but um that's where that comes from yeah um uh it, and in in the cultural context it's it, again it's 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 relevant it's to us in the west it's so what spoon and fork um spoon and fork was also part of the a long modernization process in thailand to to go from the traditional thai eating with the hands like they still do in india in many places to eating with a spoon and fork um it was actually government policy we must encourage Thais, if Thais are to be seen as civilised people in the, by the West, if we are to be civilised, we must use spoon and fork and stop wearing sarongs and we must, and women must not go topless in the streets. Mm. And Chinese uh, merchants mustn't carry stuff on their heads. Um, I mean, yeah. You think well, what's that got to do with uh government it, it, it's everything to do with government um in thailand at the time this is this policy kind of grew out of sentiment from the elites coming down to the middle classes so in the 30s uh the uh thai government at the time actually published cultural mandates they were called <laughs> you know dictating what was culturally acceptable and not what wasn't. Um, and this is, you know, the history of, Th I mean, that's why Thailand, even though it wasn't technically colonized, it, it, um, it went through its own modernization, and, which included all these sort of diktats. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure you can get that from this poem though. You get a bit of it. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I I looked up Marshall, so I read, and read a bit mm. about him, because um, I didn't know about him. So that was uh, you can find out if you if you're interested. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you've read us now five poems from the early part of your father's life about that life in Asia, mm. um, and then you know, there's nothing really about the life that you lived back in Australia afterwards. So it's really the focus. Oh, yeah, that's true. And, and we did mention I might talk about ordering the book. Uh, I did want to keep more of the poems that are about Sydney or set in Sydney, but Lisa suggested I leave out some of those, um, even though I think they were worthy poems. Uh, but I think in the larger scheme of things, you, you've got you've got uh, geographical regions. You've got Southeast Asia, and then you've got there's a bit of this in the hospital in it's in Canberra. Mm. 
that, that then there's Hawaii, I think. I've forgotten uh, how yeah. the, how yeah. the ge geographies line up, actually. Anyway, sincerity, we can talk about that afterwards, but okay. And um, uh, sincerity, can I help my beautiful father? A line from Emily Stewart's poem about her father. I wanted a father before midnight, before I dreamt of him again and where he might take me, to islands and forests I've never seen, to deserts where we are the aliens, but where we find our better selves. I knew if I answered the phone, my father would have a new illness to share. Illness was normal, almost predictable. One day the illness was anger. He told me bad things about my writing. My writing was inaccurate and he was seriously worried about the book I intended to publish and the fact he might lose a leg. I was able to tell him to get better. It was more than rhetoric. It was magical thinking and that time he did get better, I mean, for a while, in that semi-miraculous way he did. A week later, we were watching the telly and sharing a takeaway curry. Wired up with morphine, our conversation improved. He saw no art in hospitals, but art was there if you looked carefully, he said. If you close your eyes and imagined it, you could see art in hospitals. Irony was our shared pleasure, but irony in medicine is a bad mix, especially for his favourite oncologist who had the kind of irony that spares us all the painfully obvious. You might have been hiding, she might have been hiding her feelings, but she didn't seem to have any. One has to accept the fact that some doctors display autistic tendencies that make empathy difficult. When my father offered the nurse a chocolate, she shared an intimacy about her weight, but it wasn't weight she cared about, it was sugar levels. There was a lesson in that, but he still tried to eat the chocolates. When she inserted the catheter, my father seemed to submit his hand to her full manipulation. She was delicate, and he took the needle, delicately. Across the aisle, someone was taking her enemy leftovers spiked with bile. I'd been cycling in the Brindabellas. I fully intended to share with a sick man my VO2 max, my threshold power, my recovery rate, this would compensate for the fact that I have never won a single race in my life. Who was the winner now? In the end, when you're in ICU, don't be dumb enough to talk fitness to your ailing father or compare that to poetry. Talk Buddhism or Hinduism. Allow the staff to believe. We didn't argue. We both agreed to agree more often. Or not to say we didn't agree. We both enjoyed the fact that Lee Sales showed contempt for the evasions of a minister. Her toughness belied his fragility. Irony again. When I got home, my wife was right. I had oversalted the rice, and I will always love her for telling me that. Everything you can learn, you forget. Um, it's, later, so, it's later. This is in Canberra, and towards yeah. the end of your life. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and reading that um, again, uh, what, what's I going to say? Um, oh, yeah, I think we were talking about agreeing not to say that we didn't agree. I think this encapsulates the sort of the end of the negotiations of, of what you can say, what you can't say, what you, you, uh, what, what the best um, state to be in with with your with your son or father mm. the father son uh which is is part of the the mode the the atmosphere it's a sort of reconciliation poem in that sense yeah. uh, but it's also a reality that when when you are you can i mean there are some unfortunate people who don't who always will never reconcile to that point they'll with their dying relatives, which is, I think, would be a tragedy. Really, uh, you know, it's a forgiveness poem. Yeah, but uh, unlike the earlier poems, where you could only be present in an imaginary way because you weren't yet alive, uh, here you're right in the middle of it. Mm. Um, 
it's your relationship with your father it's it's central and and the poem explores some of the complexity in that relationship you know the tensions the anxieties the interactions mm. the shared mm. irony um, mm. i want to go to the opening stanza um because i thought that was stunning um mm. thank you it's full of longing to me can you mm. can you take us through that stanza and the thinking behind it you know i wanted a father mm. before midnight and etc mm. well I, um midnight of course can, is a metaphor for death i suppose <laughs> mm -hmm. uh but also it's my own death could be or my own uh despair or something uh, i wanted a father i think that's always driven uh my motivations to to write about him which is about i think why anyone would write about uh the people who are you know close to you um the fact that it, it implies that i didn't have a real a father that or the father wasn't 100 percent present but who can be mm. um so there's that longing uh before i wanted it all before i dreamt of him again um yeah uh literally presence i mean a dream is is not it's it's the removal displacement of a presence um i wanted a father before midnight before i dreamt of him again and where i wanted to know where he might take me so um yeah this this child like it, uh, my as a child he was often not around so he was traveling or didn't want to be around or you know my mother that his relationship was difficult he spent a, a lot of time doing his own thing or going to parties or whatever but he did take me to 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 lots of parties in, in sydney actually um in the international in other countries he was hardly ever there so he we he seemed to be in another country often like when we were in Thailand, he was in Sydney, or when we were in Malaysia, he was on business somewhere often. So I'd remember him coming home with presents and all that stuff. Um, and also I'd, I would always ask him, where should we go next? You know, I like enjoyed getting in the car and going somewhere. So he'd take, he had taken me on road trips in Australia. Uh, actually, I've never really written about that. Uh, he never took me to, on big uh, trips or holidays, apart from the one the one up north to Brisbane or somewhere like that. Uh, he came to see me in Bali with his new his second family. Uh, so I I was in his position of taking being the host to him. But yeah, the childhood thing is I want to go somewhere. I want my father to take me somewhere nice. <laughs> um even des deserts he lived in in alice springs uh, as for a few years where he was uh, worked for the parks and wildlife as a landscape architect we were kind of technically others you know we were visitors but he felt very at home there uh i visited him in alice springs a couple of times anyway uh and we we had happy times our better selves were our better selves, I think, are the happy times, the less fraught times. Yeah. Mm. Of course, well, yeah, you can't ask for it when someone's dying. No. What was the semi-miraculous way he had about him? Um. Well, yeah, I don't know why. In a way, that I put that in, and now I, don't, I really don't know why I put that in. Um. Well, it follows it, on from your magical thinking, but I... Uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, it was... I think because we always thought that this was this was it, you know. <laughs> um, he did have serious problems, uh, health problems, um, and his mood as well, but he'd, you know, he'd get out of those things. And it seemed he... he, he uh, yeah. He he could do that. He could he could uh, go from very low to to very high, um, and uh, that seemed 
a surprise. It was. It's probably an exaggeration to see, say miraculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the end of the poem, uh, you go home and and you know your wife is there and, mm. and finished with the line, everything you can learn you forget. Yeah. Well, I think um, it was something that. Uh, that I kept thinking of on my when I talked to him and my visits. Um, uh, what what can we learn from this? What this is our last period of of learning from each other. Uh, if if it if it's if we learn something that is unbearable, we can still forget it. I think. I mean, it's uh, it's sort of saying the opposite of uh, everything that that's horrible. You can't forget. Um, it's sort of a, a hopefulness thing. I think it's a bit, uh, it's it's ironic. I don't I don't think it's possible now. <laughs> Maybe forgetting, you can forget um, lots of things, but not everything. I know the body, yeah. the body can forget pain, for example. Yeah. Um, but but I found it interesting because you know we we have a society which is so obsessed with memory and not losing it mm, mm. um and, and... Uh, yeah yeah i'm glad you brought that up yeah um yeah the whole question of of well there's there's yeah d deliberate forgetting and there's also you know just alzheimer's um uh, he didn't he didn't have that he, his memory was pretty good uh but he one thing he said was there are lots of things about me you'll never know or I'm never going to tell you. <laughs> uh, so he hadn't forgotten everything. Um, I think. I think. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that's popped into my head that last that last sentence, and I I'm not sure if I should leave it in or not um, because it's so overstated. But I I left it in anyway. Um, if I left it out completely, I'm not sure the poem feels complete. Um, no, I wouldn't leave it out because I uh, think you leave something for the reader to ponder, and I I think that's a useful thing. Maybe that that's it. Yeah, I mean it's patently um, challenge. It's it's a question, mm. it's, but you know, putting in a question, can you forget everything you learn? Doesn't sound good, and <clears throat> a bit sentimental. Uh, I think I, it was something I said to myself in my worst moments. Um, you know, you you can you can put it out of your mind. Uh, all the bad things that had happened, or all the bad moments we had, you don't have to take them with you. And that's true. I I haven't. Mm. I've forgotten a lot of the stuff that gave me pain, mental pain. <laughs> um, and and you start you start with the you know epigraph from Emily Stewart. Can I help my beautiful father? Mm, mm, uh, that's which, a beautiful line. It's a beautiful line, and and but you're you know you're seeing him in the light of a beautiful father. Mm. So gives the poem. You know, we understand that there's difficulty and there's complexity, mm. nuance, and there's all the rest of it. But at the end of it, he's still a beautiful father, and. Mm. Uh, and it gives the poem, I think, a huge amount of poignancy. Um, mm, mm. I think that's that's a, a perfect way to, you know, introduce yeah. the poem is with that with that epigraph. Um, mm. I, and and I the agree. answer is the answer is that I see in the poem is uh, yes, yeah, yeah, because because yeah. you're there for him and yeah. and you you're yeah. you're agreeing to agree with him or not to mm. fight. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yes, it, it, it was. Yes, it was uh, healing for both of us. Um, and uh, obviously, so much could go wrong <laughs> if I'd said the wrong thing or I got, I got angry. You know, the anger is my illness as well. Mm. Uh, you know, it's it's everyone's anger can be good. It's a, anger is what sets a limit as well. But that day, or one day, the illness was anger. It was an illness, not not a not a good thing. Um, yeah. Uh, 
this was a previous conversation. Not think... not not at the re not at the hospital. It mm. should be he had told me, you know, in in the time before the hospital. Um. But I didn't. Again, that's spilling out things. They, yeah. No, we, we did go over that in the hospital. We we re re reflected on that. That he he stopped talking to me for for months, <laughs> and was very uh, angry at me yeah, for having written the memoir and published it. Uh, though he, I don't think he could read it fully. You know, the, the, again, the, the memoir is trying to do the same thing. It's trying to be a confession and a um, a letter I couldn't say to him. And, uh, an and all these things, you know, um, but he couldn't read it, so. <laughs> which is painful for me. Yeah. But, you know, memoirists often say, oh, don't 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 publish until they're gone. And I just made the decision I wouldn't wait that long. So, which might have been a bad decision, but I don't know. It doesn't matter now <laughs> to me. What, what do you think you would have made of a poem like this? Um, I don't know. Don't really know. I, I, because he, uh, he was a bit unpredictable and could take things in different ways. Uh, he might have found it irritating. Or, I don't know. Or possibly he might have loved it. I don't know. So, yeah. don't know. All right. Can we get on to another one? Yeah. Uh, I think this is the... We've got two more, I think. Two more. Okay. Paralipsis at midnight. Um, I'll explain paralipsis later. Paralipsis at midnight. My opponent is a lying thief who hates babies and puppies but I'm not going to say bad words about him. Richard M. Nixon. Every man hates the man who threatens him. After the politics, too many elegies, fake and real. I sleep in the bed of a dead man, often myself. I share no secret, nor confess to how my rivals inspire me. No bad word slanders him, their faults become seductive at midnight. It would be unseemly to reflect on a drinking problem. I envy them their passion if I can steal it, like a bully who reminds me of my enemy, the unforgivable boy in myself. I won't say a bad word about my opponent, that man who suggests the absence of love and its opposite, your partner most admired, your father in the adjoining room still breathing. Mm. You're going to say something about paralipsis? Yeah. Well, it what Richard Nixon said is paralip. It's it's where you you your intention is to denigrate somebody, and then you immediately deny that that's your intention. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, rhetorical figure. It's a rhetorical device that politicians use all the time. Uh, you know, I won't, I don't want to uh, denigrate him or I don't want to uh, sound critical, but. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know where I, why this becomes about my father, but, uh, bec and how it, I, I've, it's, it's a long, the original draft was about two pages long. Uh, it's, it, and this was the last one that got in the book and I turned it, I think it's a sonnet or something. Um, and it just says everything I need to say. <laughs> um, paralipsis at midnight. Okay. Am I being par doing the paralipsis? Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, again, I've been doing this in uh, deliberately. I'm saying I'm going to write about a book of, of a problematic, relationship of a person I both I was very ambivalent about you know there are all these things about him I didn't like he did this that and the other he he was this or that but I'm not going to say a bad word about him yeah it's, uh that's that's it it's sort of 
a large framework. Um, or you can reverse that and say, these are all the bad things about him. Um, I'm not going to say bad words about him. Uh, or, you know, this is, a, this is a great portrait of how wonderful he was, but I'm going to tell you all these things too. Yeah. I'm not sure which way it has to go. Um, um, I mean, you, you've mentioned a number of times irony, uh, mm. the irony you shared with your father. Can you say something generally about your use of irony in your poetry and in, in particular how this poem uses irony? Yeah. I, um, okay. Simply put, um, <clears throat> well, the simplest form of irony is, is saying something without meaning it. Um, you know, I love that man. Uh, there's that kind of irony. Um, there's the irony of, of, you know, everything you can learn, you forget where the irony falls on slight, slightly giving away the fact that it's, it can't, it's not a sincere statement. I think why the previous poem was called sincerity was a, um, an effort to try and write a, a poem without irony at all. Mm. Um, and in a way that a lot of it is without irony. It's what it is. It's saying what you think. There's no... Another form of irony is, is saying something and then putting something against it which contradicts it, um, you know, a kind of unsaid irony, you know. It was a beautiful day. The next, you know, there was three feet of snow outside the front door. <laughs> I mean, that could be irony or it could be... I'd like genuine, to be genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's the irony of, of which is verbal, you know. Oh my God, you know, how, how could he do that? And, but that's hard to get across in text. Um, um, I don't know. This, I, 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 as I typed this in, I had to transcribe it. I thought I had to. I was wondering about irony again. It would be unseemly to reflect on a drinking problem. Well, that's strange. It's it's a ventri it's it's a strange tone, isn't it? Unseem. It's sort of deliberately uh, um, pompous. You know, um, I I don't think I'm pompous. I don't want to be pompous. Uh, I do reflect on the drinking problem, so that's an irony, but not here. Um, um, I mean, the poem is a is it almost like a sequence of statements. There's a bunch of one-liners with a full stop at the end. Um, each of which each of which can be read on its own. Um, what hmm. was your intended cumulative effect of combining them one after the other like that? Well, the frame, the paralipsis, um, but also to break down the 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 barrier between what I'm, you know, the person I'm slandering and the person I love. Uh, again, no binaries should be, you know, I'm trying to dissolve the binary. Um, you know, I did love him. I, I, I did hate him. I, he had all these problems, but I, he was also this, this sort of person. Um, he's still there. Um, uh, he's still admired. He's still alive. Uh, it seemed like those that ending had to be there after all of that. Without again, without that sincerity at the end, it's not much really. Uh, I think that in earlier drafts, those those last three lines aren't there at all. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, it was more of a yeah a literary exercise before, mm. without any reference. Again, putting it into this collection gives it. Uh, depth otherwise it would be just an exercise you know uh, a language poem perhaps <laughs> mm. which is fine you know you could leave it there mm. I like doing that it's just again it's a process of well what experimentation um, it doesn't have to be referential it doesn't have to be real it's just an exploration of rhetoric which is a, a not fashionable at the moment to be so formalistic I don't think not that un, un, unless you're, you know, into language 
exercises and games and experimentation on on that level it it meant nothing to me deeply until those last lines you know. what about you know the unforgivable boy in myself oh yeah well that 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 um that's a very important line obviously um it references um the bad things in myself and my all my own faults yeah that's what it's about it's not why, why can he why can he not be forgiven the unforgivable boy yeah ah uh, oh, it's just things you do that you don't forgive yourself for you know uh bullying people when i was a boy i i was bullied myself but i think like i must have been nasty to other people i feel it's unforgivable <laughs> uh, in, on some it it feels unforgivable I mean, you can say, oh, look, you're just young men. You didn't know what you're doing. And, but I think there's some things, the things, our temperaments, some things in us stay stay a bit persistently and, and annoying, you know, and they're bad. They're just not morally bad. They're just um, not pleasant. Uh, work in progress, Adam. I mean, <laughs> we're, all, we're progress. all worked in progress, you know. <laughs> there's always hope. We can always... Yeah. Can always and, change things for the better. Um, my ancestors were Scots Presbyterians. You know, <laughs> they found they fa found forgiveness very difficult at times, and and it is a trait yeah. in my in my ancestry. They could be so nasty about each other, they could be so unforgivable, and and, uh, and I think my father had that problem actually. He could never find it in his heart to to forgive his father who left him who abandoned him and stuff like that you know but uh, very important to do that yeah forgive indeed yeah um i'm struck by your use of midnight again so that's appeared again um and here oh. here it almost to me suggests the doomsday clock <laughs> like time yeah. is right I've got to sort this out was that your thought or were you using it just to it's, it's a it's a bit of an overused word in in, yeah. in poetry. But it's a time when but, you know your thoughts are drifting, you're fast yeah. getting towards sleep. Yeah, totally, totally. Keats or Coleridge in there, <laughs> who I love. I did. I read a lot of romantic poetry when I was younger. Yeah. No, no bad word slanders him. Their faults become seductive at midnight. I don't know if that's Keats. More like more like Byron or somebody. Uh, I don't know. I can't tell you, I'm afraid. <laughs> right, let's go on to the last poem that you're going to read, the Stendhal Express. Yeah, Stendhal. Stendhal. Uh, the Stendhal, pronounced in the French way, Stendhal. The Stendhal Express, Piedmont. Lombardy, Milan, splendid places to lose your luggage. I know that damn the career feeling. A perpetual flight from official choices. Army or church, the red or the black, indecisive Belgian weather. At some point, your fate predicts there will be a turning point when second rate turns to genius. Considered a bumpkin, I lost the accent just like that, created a hundred pseudonyms and lived them all. My enemies became my loan sharks. I recorded each lover's alibi a functionary in Napoleon's retreat and never got to give orders. When we went dysfunctional, we would write in small, poor countries, romantic, bored and isolated, but consular in bearing, leaning on a column in the sun, in boots, with a horsewhip thrown in. Advanced age brings biography, memoirs of the self as a young man, sensitive but well hidden until pathologies are revealed. The alcoholic father, the demanding mother, both ideal, but also ordinary. At 15, I adored the novel my mother read to me. It hardly mattered then whom the Austrians despised, that Mathilde went in search of better men, though it matters so much now. Perhaps I'll never read enough of you, lost as I am in a hilltop kingdom with no reception. Did you really say that prison was a moral lesson we could all enjoy? 
I wanted to see the monastery you never left, place so beautiful you didn't outgrow it. Locked in a study, you saw a theory of love on a single playing card and scattered the pack through the Alps, the whole world marching onto a page. Um, lots to explain, though I, I don't know how much of this is means much to people who don't uh, know much about the writer Stondahl, the novelist. So I'll let you just question me <laughs> if you need All right. to. I, this is one that's not about your father. No, not really. No, it's uh, it's not. It's, it's really just about, um, again, r being a writer and the sort of egotism about it and the, the self-deceptions. And, you know, I, I've done this all, all my time as a poet, um, deflating my my. So I think, I, I mean, writing for me has always been so tied up with my ego and um, what I want to be and I, any kind of failure, I, I can make something that's not a failure into a failure or, you know, I'm, I didn't get it. I was relating to Stondahl's memoir about, you know, regret. It is a, about a regret, but also about... Uh, you know, again, not looking, not seeing your own privilege, not, and being a bit self-pitying, really. Self-pity is just silly. <laughs> uh, but so it's a, it's a satire. You know, I enjoyed writing it. It just gets rid of in excess self-regard. <laughs> um, well, I was just going to um, sort of flick, flick through the book, um, not just the poem, because um, it has a literary flavour to it. There are references throughout to, you know, Somerset Maugham, we've discussed, Proust, Flaubert, Wallace Stevens, René Char, Stendhal. Um, was your childhood steeped in literature or, or did that come later? Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, it, uh, my interest in literature didn't really take off till I was about... 14, when I had a great teacher who I was in one of the lowest I was we had stream it streamed classes at my high school and I was in the second lowest me too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't I was really bad at writing essays and I hated writing it and um, though I you know as an adolescent I wrote the usual thing but, but um I, I just when when I had this lesson about the rhyme of the ancient mariner, I just my eyes lit up. I just loved it, and uh, it stuck with me. This that you could do this with with poetry. So before that, I mean, I had been at primary school. I had written a poem that got got uh, uh, praised by the teacher, and I I, I had. I had to read it out in front of the class after an, an excursion. It was about about a sea eagle in Manly Park or something. So I had a very that was age nine. So I, at age nine, I had a had a had a very positive experience with writing, which obviously set me up. I, not that I knew it at the time. Uh, and then high school. There was a literary magazine. I think I, I I got better at high school after that rhyme of the ancient mariner. Got mm. promoted. <laughs> there you go. Um, then at uni, I yeah, that was about. I uh, I was my godfather's uh, David Malouf. So, and I uh, I managed. We we my mother and I could stay at his flat when he was away for six months. Had surrounded by great books so I just read and I was 16. Wow. I bought myself a typewriter when we still use typewriters. <laughs> you know, uh, I learned to type. Uh, that was great, you know, because uh, with a typewriter, every draft you write, you have to start again. Yeah. And you kept all the old drafts and then I got white out and stuff. And, um, and then when I changed to word processing, I, my writing went downhill. I just couldn't write properly uh, because 
I didn't keep the drafts. Mm. Um, I didn't rewrite things. Uh, but somehow I've gotten used to that. Anyway, back to your question. Yeah, that is a literary thing. Physically learning how to type and writing poems on a typewriter for no reason but to because you want to. Uh, then I went to poetry readings in at Exiles Bookshop in Oxford Street. Mark John Tranter, Martin Johnson, Gig Ryan. They were all there. And I was only 18. And mm. I was amazed. I loved it. It was just this is my tribe. I almost I was no one knew who I was, but then I went to uni and I met Chris Mansell and Dennis Haskell. We no, we didn't have creative writing, um, but we had English lit, so I did all that. Yeah. But I also went to writing workshops at lunchtime with Dennis Haskell and you know, so it was all real. These were real people. They'd come from outside the department, Robert Adamson, John Forbes, uh, uh, people from from the US would read. They were real people. I just felt they were, I felt so excited, you know, to be part of part of that. Um, and luckily, I just managed to get poems in magazines and they're yeah. all positive publishing experiences for a long time um and then yeah the inevitable thing happens you get disappointed your book you you have great expectations and your book doesn't get shortlisted or or no one's no one buys it or especially poetry especially. or you think oh my god you feel like everything it's so important to me but no one cares you have to go through all that yeah. Uh, and then you have to to keep going uh, despite it all. And so these poems for me are kind of keep going poems, you know, mm. that don't take it too seriously. And, you know, you have done all this and it's it's a spectacle. You know, it's a that's it's a lifestyle. If you know, so when you finish this poem with the whole world marching onto a cage. Yeah. That, that has a real attraction for you, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, I love compression, yeah. I, think. I love poetry more than novels, but novels leave you that great... It's a satisfaction that you can read this again and do it all again, and it's there. Uh, you can have this adventure all over again. I mean, Stondahl, when I read him when I was young, my mother had copies and stuff, and I read The Red and the Black. It's about... A young man it's a young man having to decide whether to, to to join the army or become a priest uh so that was an important theme for me when i was 17 or 18 not not that i wanted to be a priest but you know the whole career thing um and then the book the fate thing you know thing he just the story takes him on wars and disappointments and he falls in love and all that uh and then the memoir stuff is advanced age and it is about me now as getting old and writing about memoir and stuff uh, and all those things you have to reveal but you know, you've written eight books so i was just wondering whether the, the the whole world marching onto a page propels your own writing that notion propels your own writing keeps it going Oh yeah, yeah. I like, I like to, I like to. I, I don't really worry about the whole world anymore. <laughs> it's a bit much, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah, the the formalism. Yeah, the page is important to the A four page or the B five page. Uh, it's a very literary concern. Uh, form, you know. I mean, I like watching movies and YouTube videos as well, but I don't make any of that. So that's where I'm where I'm at. The, um, just going back to the poem, you, you've mentioned the red and the black, which was one of his uh, novels. Um, and and from my reading of the poem, this poem is the narrator of the poem is Stendhal himself. Mm. Uh, but who is the you the narrator is addressing? Is it is it one of the characters of his novel, The Charter House of Palmer, or is it someone else? Oh, in my ah, uh, you it could be again. That's I just yeah, I, I thought about this yesterday. Um, uh, in the you you could be Stendhal, it could be me as well. So it's again I'm slipping 
slipping into Stondahl's persona. Um, I lost the accent. Well, he talked, Stondahl talks about how he was a provincial and had to check, sound Parisian to get by in Paris because I didn't like his accent when he was a young man. Um, and where does it say change to you? Oh, did you really say that prison was a moral lesson we could all enjoy? Oh, yeah, the you is uh, Ston. I think it was Stondahl. I've, I've lost memory of where that. Oh, perhaps I'll never read enough of you, lost as I am in some hilltop kingdom with no reception. So yeah, I'm... I think Stondahl. I'll never read enough of you classics. And... But it could be, it, it, it is a slippage because he writes about um, he he being in a monastery writing his memoirs which was and he never wanted to leave but he i think he had to or mm. he he was stuck there or something or exiled there or wanted to be exiled and i wrote this when i was in france alone and felt felt that where i was living was a bit like that i was becoming monkish and isolated and and it was so beautiful but lonely and romantic and uh, you know, Rilke lived lived in a castle that owned by one of his rich friends, some aristocrat, and he went off and you know the whole writer in the tower yeah. stuff. Yeah, but um, but you can do a lot when you're in that state of mind. The theory of love. Mm. Um, well, I, yeah, I've, I've loved talking with you. Yeah, it's been very. Very pleasurable, David. Thanks for for inviting me and uh, choosing this topic, uh, this book or my book, and choosing that as a topic uh, to bring it together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your poems and exploring your experiences, thoughts, and insights on the theme of dealing with fathers in poetry. We could go on, but I have to wind it up. Uh, details yep. of Adam's books and where to get them will be posted with this podcast, so please look out for them. Uh, Poets Corner will return in a month or so with Charmaine Paper Talk Green reading poems and talking on the theme of Aboriginal female Indigenous data sovereignty, culture smart data, exploring the relationship between colonisation and Indigenous data sovereignty through my personal stories. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Thank you.